monitors uh, have uh, very high formaldehyde values, much higher than anything that I cited in the previous um, slide. Um, so uh, on the low end, uh, we have 69 parts per billion. On the high end, we have 127 uh, parts per billion formaldehyde. On the lower left-hand corner there is the wind, um, is, is a picture of where the wind is blowing from. It was blowing primarily from the south, okay, almost exclusively from the south. Okay. Um, so, um, so why are we seeing these very high formaldehyde values, higher than even the Houston Ship Channel with the best monitors uh, available? Um, is it because the uh, cars are emitting that from the from the from the state highway 303 there, um, uh, or is it because of some other source? Is it because of the compressor engines? So you have a, a couple of compressor stations there and, and compressor engines. It's a whole bunch of uh, facilities on that side. Uh, so, next slide. Uh, uh, I'm not here to pan the oil and gas industry. We're a boundary organization. You know, we're just interested in the truth. Okay? So, uh, what I think are, are problems with the study can cut both ways. Some of it might benefit the oil and gas industry, some of it might not. Okay? So, the first question in my mind is, well, why do we have such high concentrations? Well, uh, it could be because the contractor uh, Employed the standard EK method uh, TO 11A. This is for, uh, this is measured from my lab with uh, the NPH cartridges uh, and high performance liquid uh, chromatography UV analysis. Um, so a lot of people do that. It's pretty standard. But uh, I called up uh, the guru. I asked uh, to speak to EPA Hawaii's uh, guru on uh, uh, on method uh, TO 11A. I was directed to Don Whitaker. and he told me that he thought that this method, even though it's a standard method, is kind of problematic. Um, because of chemical interferences from NOx emissions. So, you know, uh, we may need better methods than uh, TO11A to figure out what the real story uh, is. Um, then the other thing is that uh, the Titan Engineering Report uh, attributed the high uh, values to either the, the freeway, the, the state highway, uh, or some source that they couldn't name because it wasn't on the map. Just, uh, and they said that, well, Look at the upwind concentrations. Those upwind concentrations may not be caused by the facilities because they were upwind. But if you look at the uh, picture, it's only slightly upwind. It's like within 50 meters uh, of the compressor uh, stations there, or something like that. At any rate, so uh, when you're that near, uh, in the presence of nearby structures, you can get air counterflows if you do com a computational fluid dynamics model and see this. You know, that's why we you do that in the street can you see there are counterflows. Okay. Uh, so even though the winds blow from the south, you can have a counterflow that might be conveying formaldehyde from the uh, compressor engines uh, to the slightly upward sides. Okay. So and Jake, are you pretty close to wrapping up? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so the conclusions are that emissions of, of human and uh, of the human exposure to formaldehyde due to oil and gas exploration and production may be underestimated. But by how much we don't really know because conventional monitoring techniques are too sporadic. You know, they have uh, one set of one hour measurements there, and that's it for the whole 24 hours, even though you have 24 hour average uh, samples being taken as well. And they're too inaccurate to quantify from our exposure to emissions in the shales. Um, so we need to do a better job. Uh, and in my next talk, hopefully uh, tonight, uh, I'll show you some available new techniques that, that you can use to, to do a better job with the conventional monitoring. And you might benefit from control from other emissions from oil gas sites in order to come into the attainment of the ozone standard. Thank you very much. Any questions? Richard? Yeah, Richard. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, next two speakers will be. I'll see you next fall. And Faith Chatham.
politics is local, all air emission is local. And what we're really about is trying to protect the most valuable, the most vulnerable among our society. And there is a, an economic justice kind of issue that comes in because invariably it seems that when they're putting in a pipeline, they choose the houses in the low-income areas to do their trenching, and they do quarrying in the high-income areas where they hardly notice that it happens. Because of lawsuits, we really should not have to have a lawsuit to have regulatory agencies protect us. Poor people, ordinary working people, can't afford attorneys. And it's very hard to find an environmental attorney who has to work with the other side. So lawsuits are very problematic. We need to be able to be able to find a way of addressing issues where we need to do appeals within the agency. For instance, in this body, you see the names of our city council members. And I respect many of them and our mayor. But before we started with oil and gas drilling, they had $80 million worth of revenue come into the city through oil and gas. So when an individual comes up above them for a, for a zoning issue or a problem, they are talking to an already compromised body. The same happens very often on the state level when we go to our Railroad Commission, our TCEQ, because these are political appointments. And truthfully, we're talking to you of the EPA, and there's a lot of hard work that you have been doing in the last few years. But you're the sleepy giant. When we fail to do things in a timely manner, we have to work very, very hard to catch up. And it stretches the people of the staff to all those immortal levels. One of the photographs you see up there is a picture of the UTA Carrizo well. This is on state property, so city ordinances didn't apply. The daycare center, and you see the playground there very close to the pad site, that daycare center was built by the YWCA just before Carrizo came into UTA and they signed the agreement and decided to put the pad site with 26 wells with all of the emissions coming. There is no continuing air quality monitor there. We are going and shut, but talk about the canisters. The canisters are a snapshot in time. One of the first jobs I had was working in my hometown doing air stack analysis and wastewater analysis for DARCO. And I know the times that we were out of compliance, but if we'd only had a canister taken every two or three months, we would have looked really good. Those children need to have 24 hours seven monitoring and the people who are extracting the resources and who are making the money should pay for the monitoring and should pay for the enforcement and should pay for the inspectors. We also have to make sure that those companies are financially stable enough that when the, the fluctuations of the market change, they will still be here because many of the biggest problems we have are from abandoned wells. The entire process needs to be decided. You need to look at what's going to be the cost of air emissions from everything that comes into that situation. You see up there around preventable pipeline hazards, that's a, neighbor, a low income neighborhood here in Arlington over on Daniel Drive. And those people would not have had those backhoes and those drag lines and that diesel apartment right there by their houses if it had not been that someone had permitted a well and they needed a pipeline. That was through existing on poor right of way. So those people were given no advance notice whatsoever. They claimed that it did. There was a landman that went out into a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood and left his business card on the door and said, call me. 24 hours later, the backhoes appeared. Thank you so much. But one of the things that we must have is the, 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 the uh, federal regulations, the code of regulations, federal relations need to be strengthened because we're not going to do anything statewide or locally that's stronger than what we do usually. We have to have those regulations so that citizens can make a complaint and it be simple for them to make a complaint. And when we get the reports back, it needs to be in understandable language. You should not have to have a master's in environmental science to understand that it is 
continual exposure to children. I am angered when I hear people cite long-term exposure, short-term exposure, and say it takes 70 years for these things to make an impact, when we know it doesn't take that long if you've already been compromised or you're a child. Thank you so very much. I'm going to hand you my handout because it has a lot of the things that we are asking for. We're available at any time. Thank you so much. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate y'all's time and <coughs> dedication. Uh, in the U.S. employment in natural gas, it left, it left in growth from 17% in 2006 to 2008. And that was representing one in four net new jobs created during that period of time throughout the entire U.S. economy. Natural gas supports an estimated 2.8 million American jobs in more than 30 states. And now each home more than 10,000 natural gas jobs. According to an in-depth economic analysis completed by the ASH Global Insight, the natural gas industry is responsible for nearly 1.3 million total jobs, or roughly 12% of our total employment. And of the total jobs, 249,000 direct jobs. And those with employed in the natural gas industry will continue to grow with prudent management. Another 329,000 jobs are indirect jobs, meaning they are dependent up on natural gas and outside the industry. And finally, there are 691,000 induced jobs, those that were created by expenditures of direct and indirect employees. And this has meant a lot to me. I should have told you I was a commissioner for 16 years in Johnson County. And we are in the largest producing, second largest producing county. And uh, we got hit like a rocket ship down there when it all come in, everybody went crazy on the way. We do have air pollution problems from my home in Johnson County. I used to see the two domes of the nuclear power plant during the day. And I see them. We are a large trucking industry camp. Very few people realize that they make no way. They don't realize that we have a lot of sand, gravel, silk sand plants. Now, with the addition of the gas industry, it's a, it's, it's trucking. We cannot live without trucking. Trucking gets us our food, it gets us our fuel, it gets us everything that we live with on a day-to-day -day basis. But I've noticed down through the years that uh, I've never known anything that was perfect except my wife, she tells me every day. <laughs> And she is a very nice lady. She put up with me for 43 years, but she would have been an old maid if she hadn't met me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've noticed in life that uh, against her sometimes cause more problems than they cure. If against her would work as hard with people that you're trying to be against to help them, I think we would have a great economy great country which we do. We are the greatest country in the world to live in. But if we continue on certain paths of over regulation, we will simply send the pollution that y'all are trying to control and trying to correct and help people work with. We'll just send it to Russia and then when the jet stream comes around we're going to break it in. But we didn't get nothing for what we sent on. And I worked with Governor Ann Richards when she first came in on her energy. She was big on wanting to convert to natural gas and to the LP. She even started the policy of that. And something that you, you gentlemen are smart, y'all know people are smart, something's bugged me. And I wish one of you could ever find out and call me and tell me. As a young boy on a poor farm growing up in Somerville County, all the farmers over there converted their trucks. LP, 